And thank you. Thank you so much for joining me today as we work our way through our yoga anatomy by Leslie Kamenoff, assisted by Amy Matthews. I will be reading from edition one, although you can also use edition two by referring to the table contents to find the posture at hand. Being demonstrated here is the lovely Monica, who I did a photo shoot for at Edge in our South Naperville location. She does a beautiful job of demonstrating where the posture could go if that was right in your practice. Uh, you might find that the pictures shown of Monica's demonstration vary some to Amy's demonstration within the book itself, and that's to be celebrated. So each one of us want to find our own place on what feels right to us, what feels right within our body, and how can we both best serve what we're looking to accomplish within any given posture. In some cases, if there were postures that I felt the benefits did not outweigh the risks, I did request that Monica maybe um, move her yogic level to something that might be a little more accessible and commonly seen and found in an all levels yoga class, uh, such as the ones that we offer at EDGE. So those are some disclaimers on that. One thing that we did try and do is could we find a way to make the adjustments, whether they be through, you know, get your practitioners into what they're doing through the cues and advance it through the qualities. How do you want them to go about doing it through the qualities? and then give them some other choices through the modifications. And as such, whenever those, those ideas are taken, it might and quite likely will adjust the primary movers. And that's okay. We're still looking to learn how to craft a class that we can um, offer a balanced class that is a full, full body experience and more importantly, helps develop balanced muscles, healthy connective tissue, and nourish the neurological system. So that's, that's kind of what I'm after and the place from which I teach these lessons to you. So you can certainly cherry pick the buffet of information provided and take what's right for you and leave the rest as always. So starting off on page 168 is Bo Pose. And if you have the second edition, you can head over to the table of contents to find out where Bo Pose is for that. Uh, so we see quite a bit of engagement in the front and the back of the body in Bo Pose. And I think it is a lovely way to experience that back bend. Nova thinks so too. So I'll give you two minutes to give these two pages a read and then we'll talk about it further. Okay, welcome back. I hope you had a chance to read through some of the key things that are found in this posture in our book here. And what we want to consider when we decide how do I want to present a pose, how do I want to offer it up to my student body or even for yourself in your own personal practice, that's why you're taking this class, um, are the following. So we want to think about joint actions. What are the joints doing? Which joints are involved? So if we consider the joint actions to be, you know, really the body's just an assembly of pulley and levers, if you will. And what's working, right, with, with these joint actions? When we bend something, 
Do we have more work or less work? Is it more accessible? Does it change the primary movers? And if so, what does that look like? Uh, and that is a perfectly fine thing to do. And I often say, you know, just pick up another asana, maybe deeper in your class that enhances something that didn't get met based on um, the, sh the shift of the joint actions. And the next idea is lengthening. And you may have heard me talk about this before. I was quite surprised to learn. I take the live Zooms with Leslie Kamenoff uh, each month and I've taken his his program uh, principles and also his program with Amy Matthews fundamentals program. And they, they actually revealed that they took the word stretch out of the book. So when we think yoga, we commonly think stretch. And really what we're doing is we're not stretching, we're lengthening. We're, we're looking to find lengthening through our muscular tissues and our connective tissues as well. So finding lengthening rather than a stretch. So that recoil that might happen when you move through something quickly versus when you hold things for a longer time, uh, the chance of injury that happens when the body's warm versus when the body's cold. These are some fundamental basics that we'll come back to again and again as time goes on. Uh, in the book, they talks about some specific notes. Hopefully you had a chance to read through those and also some breathing that can be encouraged in this one. And I really like that nourishing rock back and forth in this pose by pushing the belly into the floor with each inhalation as, as listed here at one, page 169. And it's just such a great for, way for the practitioner, I feel, to have enough going on physically what we're asking them to do in their practice, whether they're reaching their feet with their hands or they're using a strap to do it, um, however high up those shoulders go so that we can have an opening of the chest and a stretch through the pecs, right? That core strength and the engagement of the glutes to help ground and center us. And of course the back of the thighs, creating some muscular strength to hold those knees and feet up as well as the forearms that are holding the feet or the ends of the straps, if not holding the feet, still accomplished. So in this way, if we decide to have the prop we use for this particular posture be a strap, there's not a ton of changes uh, in, in the muscle usage. Although over time, the practitioner might find the strap can get closer and closer and closer uh, between the hands and the feet based on practice and that lengthening that we talked about. So uh, if we choose to take a different modification, something along the lines of, let's say, reaching one foot uh, at a time and then the other, we might see similar muscular usage used throughout, but uh, maybe, maybe we have to spend a little bit more time to end up with the pec stretch there if we're dividing that in two. So that's completely fine. It's just something that you'll want to be aware of as an instructor. Or again, if you're taking this course for your personal practice or your personal practice as well. So let's play around with some postures moving from there. I've seen this called different things in the book. It's called locust pose. I've also seen it called Superman and the like. Um, this one could be fun paired with swimming the arms back and resting the feet down and then swimming back up again. And I think it creates a nice organic movement and would be fitting and appropriate in a vinyasa flow class and core strengthening class and any sort of playful or hybrid class. I don't know that I would put that sequence in um, like a restorative or a gentle yoga as much, uh, but I mean, you could, depending on how you went about presenting it, certainly. As we look at the muscles being used, largely what's happening is the back of the body. So we're, once again, we're stretching the West. And so often uh, our, our, our students might experience shortened hamstrings, achy backs, uh, shortened hip flexors, which are located on the front of the body in front of the hips there. And, and what happens is we end up with an imbalance of not only how the muscles are lengthened, but how they're strengthened. And we want to try and close that margin a little bit. So by adding in these, these passive back bends, practitioners that maybe, maybe aren't quite ready for a bow or 
wheel isn't in their practice. Um, you know, locust pose can really do much of the same things as far as stretching the backside of the body, opening, opening up the lumbar spine, which is just so, so commonly slouched on and rounded and things like this, and also touching on the soleus muscles, uh, which is, is a really nice thing to do. So we have symmetry within this movement. So you could choose to do, to play around with this sequence where you move from here, you swim the arms back, you return, maybe you stack the arms level with the top of the mat and rest the forehead down as the rest and allow the feet to come to the mat as the rest and return when you're ready, you could do that. You could also play around with it where you maybe lift one side of the body and then the other that can help pro progress and advance our starburst if that's what you know your class is enjoying, things like that. How do we find symmetrical postures and shift them up in the way that they become asymmetrical and bring them back to symmetrical you know, as our neutral posture? And where do we find a rest pose in between. So that could be a fun sequence for you. And, you know, there's not as many prone face down postures in yoga that we see in, in the majority of our classes. So this is a really nice one that you can play around with. Um, commonly we see paired with a downward facing dog would be an upward facing dog, but you know, this one could be nice too. So let's say we start facing down. Let's say we even began our class. This is fun. I've seen this. We begin our class face down and our feet are relaxed, however, however feels good to the practitioner. And our elbows are out to the side with our forearms stack and our forehead is on our forehead are on our forearms and we're just taking a soft, easy breath and actually do a meditation, do a Shavasana right there. To, to catapult the class into relaxation. It can be so effective, so grounding, so nurturing, and also mix up what we commonly see where Shavasana is you know, seen at the end. Not to say that it needs to be taken away at the end after your students have worked for you, but I, I've seen it in the beginning too, and I really like it. So let's say we did that, and then we brought them into this, and then we told them at any time they can return back down onto their forearms and take a rest at any point if that felt right. Uh, we could also suggest that they drop their feet at any time and maybe bring the focus on the upper body and kind of seesaw up and down, you know, upper body, lower body, upper body, lower body, and, and the like. So things along these lines can help get to where we want to be on the locust pose. Um, I would say to some degree or another, this pose can be really fun to play around with and really fun to add to. So let's say we bring them back down to the ground and then ease into a tabletop position. Maybe we do some cat cow stretches. And then, you know, maybe if you want a side bend there, touching on the different movements of the spine, we could do some kidney squeezes where the shoulders invited toward the hip towards the hips in our tabletops and back again, coming to neutral, cat cow, send it up to downward facing dog. And now we have a really, really nice series that could, you know, incorporate a child's pose anywhere in there that we don't see in our classes every day. Uh, we don't see in this experience that I've just described um, is much of a rotation, but you could find a way to play around with some of the qualities within the postures that I've lifted, listed, or maybe even add to some of the postures you know, such as this. So let's say we um, find a supine, a face down revolved shoulder twist in the experience and then that way we're not flipping from facing down to facing up or if we reach the class where we are facing up in shavasana maybe that's then where you get that rotation that twist piece in and a revolved shoulder twist so what we're essentially looking to do is pick up the back bend which we've got it here we're looking to pick up the side bend, which we picked up in the in the kidney squeezes uh, the forward fold is um is that cat and we see the back bend again in the cow. The downward facing dog serves, according to the table of contents in this book, not only as flexion as a forward bend, but also as an arm balance. So some folks uh, may look at it that way and others not. I would say though, in class, I will commonly invite the practitioners to send the weight 
back uh, because regularly we see students trying to support their entire downward facing dog on their hands through their front body. And a real shift can happen if you, if you use a quality such as what would happen if you invited your weight back towards the feet and allow the hips to rise a bit towards the sun. I had one instructor who, who would reference, you know, imagine you have a little bunny tail and give it a little wag. And that's such a nice way to loosen up the lumbar spine connective tissue throughout and also find some play in our practice, in our work. And that's, that's a lovely, lovely thing to see. So the next posture here in page 172 is full locust pose. So I'll give you a moment to head over to table comments and get it. And as you can see, I did not choose to go with this posture uh, during the photo shoot with Monica. We decided to switch it up a little bit and say, okay, how could we go about moving these same primary movers and maybe without you know, the benefits and the risks being such a thing. So um, demonstrated here in page 172, albeit impressive, I don't know that I would personally guide it through a class, um, certainly not a group class. And if, if at all, it would be in a private session with a, with a yogi that's seasoned into this kind of yoga. Um, I don't know that I would do it. I'm glad to see that it's in the book so that we know how it can be demonstrated to do properly. That's wonderful. Uh, but really what I'm looking for here is that same stretch through the neck is demonstrated, highlighted in red in the book. And that same stretch through the front body and through the quad. So we have all of those things. And by incorporating the bolster here, it really does take off quite a bit of pressure. I did ask Monica how that felt for her with the bolster there. And she said that she really, really liked it when we were doing it. Uh, I also think that, um, you know, I, it mentions here the standard instruction to inhale while entering into a back bend can be counterproductive here. And that would be, as page 173 cites, that would be another example of, it's okay to have a certain way that you do things. And when it comes to the breath, that's no exception. Uh, but I hear again and again from both Leslie Kamenoff and Amy Matthews that whatever you're doing, just try and shift it up and do it in another way. And even though that might, might perhaps bring you out of your comfort level somewhat, I think that the advancement of the asana practice and I think living yoga, which is a piece of that is unattachment, unattachment to how you do things. And, you know, can you find another way of doing it and still celebrate the differences? Uh, one particular thing that I would like to point out for this particular posture on page 173 is anterior neck muscles and strengthening the muscles. We often, you know, hear folks that have TMJ and so on, and we want to keep, we want to honor our scope of practice. But I also think that there's something to be said of, you know, our whole entire being head to toe is comprised of these muscular systems. And it's, it's an orchestra, a symphony, really. And we can, we can often find symmetry where there might be asymmetry in the body. And that can go such a long way in helping folks with various ailments. Although I think uh, the golden rule for staying within the practice is, within your scope of practice is, you might suggest a posture. If they say, I have TMJ, you might suggest a posture without going into a definition as to what it is or how it can make it better or how it could even make it worse. Uh, just really say, hey, let's let's do some of these uh, these yummy uh, throat stretches and let's see if we can't strengthen up the muscles within the jaw and also bring some mindful awareness to this area, particularly for folks that might clench their jaw and so on. So those are just some key things that we can do. Uh, all right, so that wraps up this portion of the book, our prone poses, this was chapter eight. So I'll go ahead and give you two minutes to jot down some journaling reflections and make some notes on these postures. And then we'll, we'll resume and come into lab and practice and play around with some teach one another and see what we can come up with 
for our own classes. So thank you so much for joining this lecture and I will see you in two.